Sulfur used with thermite is called thermate, producing even faster results. Dr. Stephen Jones performed chemical analysis on the previously molten metal. He sent a sample from this 40 pound chunk of previously molten metal from one of those meteorites. He finds that it's predominantly iron, so we can rule out aluminum from the jet plane. It has small amounts of aluminum, sulfur, and potassium, and manganese and fluorine in abundance. Manganese is from the potassium permanganate, commonly used as an oxidizer in thermite. Fluorine is also used in sol gel type thermite charges. So these appear to be the thermite fingerprint. Gel explosives are a super thermite, tiny aluminum particles in iron oxide in this sol gel. They can be cast into shape. They're like a clay. Lawrence Livermore Lab did research on this, and this invention offers a thermite-based apparatus for cutting target materials. You pack the thermite in here, and you ignite it, and it comes out and is forced through melting the structural steel element in fractions of a second, uh, almost as effective as uh, high-energy explosives, RDX and C4, which are more common in classic controlled demolitions. If sol gels were used, they would leave behind a very unique signature, 1,3-diphenylpropane. Uh, and in fact, EPA finds one molecule in their toxicological studies at levels that dwarfed all others, 1,3-diphenylpropane. Eric Schwartz says we've never observed it in any other sampling we've ever done. But is there evidence of thermite in the World Trade Center dust? Dr. Jones received no less than four separate samples of World Trade Center dust, some of it from Jeanette McKinley's apartment across the street, where the windows blew in and filled her apartment with dust. Another sample was found uh, like 10 minutes later on the Brooklyn Bridge. Well, he takes this and he puts a magnet over it, and he finds that there are small particles that come up to the magnet. Some of them are angular, some of them are round. They look like this. In fact, he calculates by the weight of the amount of these spheres that he finds in the dust that there must have been about 10 tons for, the whole, for all of the dust that was available. They're about a 16th of an inch in diameter, the largest ones, and most of them, though, are smaller than a human hair. What could produce such an incredible array of microspheres? Well, if you had thousands of cutter charges going off in the columns and beams throughout the building, and they were, they were under this incredible pressure, what you'd see is something like this. Tens of thousands or millions of tiny droplets. What's the shape of those droplets? When a liquid is dispersed like this, its surface tension forms itself into almost a perfect sphere. In the case of molten iron, that those droplets cool and they fall along with the dust everywhere. We have iron, manganese, and in, in the case of uh, this known thermite signature, it, it matches basically. In other words, we have a controlled experiment to compare the results against. Dr. Jones is not the only one who finds these iron-rich microspheres. The EPA finds them in all the dust and the toxicological studies they're doing. They have no idea where they came from. They sweep it under the rug. It has only one possible formation, and that is from liquid molten iron under extreme pressure. R.J. Lee finds the iron-rich microspheres on top of the Deutsche Bank building in their toxicological studies. Well, Dr. Jones concludes that given the mix of trace metals present in these high concentrations uh, in the dust, such as zinc, copper, and manganese, and the formation of iron-rich aluminum spheres, it's clear that significant aluminothermic reactions occur, and he can reverse engineer this and suggest to us that there must have been in the thermite mix powders of aluminum, iron oxide, copper oxide, zinc nitrate, and potassium permanganate. Well, would there possibly be any unignited thermite pieces in the World Trade Center dust? Indeed, he finds it. It also comes up to the magnet from his dust samples. Many 
chips. This one, a sixteenth of an inch long, red on one side, gray on the other. The red side is composed of tiny iron oxide particles and, and aluminum. In fact, he does an XEDS on this stuff too. And he finds a little bit of sulfur, more aluminum, lots of iron, and manganese. And compare that to the traditional thermite. It's also a match for unignited thermite. This stuff is not made in a cave in Afghanistan. The Lawrence Livermore lab came out with papers only a year or two ago about this stuff. The particles being so small allow for almost instantaneous ignition between the two chemicals, the aluminum and the iron oxide, producing very explosive results. Los Alamos lab and Lawrence Livermore lab have produced these results. Then he continues his study and finds additional chips that are partially ignited with spheres embedded in them, indicating that the source of the spheres is, for all intents and purposes, identified very clearly. With Dr. Jones and his small team of scientists, through EDS, XRF, and WDS, identifies the components of these spheres and chips, predominantly iron, along with aluminum, oxygen, silicon, 1,3-diphenylpropane. The results coupled with the visual evidence, he says, at the seams such as the flowing hot liquid metal, providing compelling evidence that thermite reaction compounds were deliberately placed in both World Trade Center towers and Building 7. These results are documented in a peer-reviewed journal. Now, all of this is direct evidence of explosive destruction in Building 7. We'll come jump back to only Building 7 now. Now, none of these characteristics can be explained by fire, let alone all of them. Let's listen to what FEMA did conclude, because it is interesting. Evidence of a severe high-temperature corrosion attack on the steel, including rapid oxidation, sulfidation, and subsequent intergranular melting. Very interesting. Remember, office fires don't melt steel. What melted this steel? Sulfur formed during this hot corrosion attack on the steel. Here is the intergranular melting documented for all of us. Thank you. Capable of turning a solid steel girder into Swiss cheese, like this former wide flange column from the structural steel in Building 7. Now, they document this very carefully in their Appendix C. The specifics of the fires in World Trade Center 7 and how they caused the building to collapse remain unknown at this time. What? Unknown? The best hypothesis, fire plus random damage, and then complete collapse, has only a low probability of occurrence. Further research, investigation, and analysis are, are needed to resolve this issue. But unfortunately, for those hoping to resolve the issue, much of that evidence had already been destroyed, about 99% of it, in fact, by FEMA. In fact, 800 truckloads a day. Easily the, third, the three worst structural failures in modern history. 250 pieces were saved. Crucial evidence that could answer the questions is on the slow boat to China, exclaims Bill Manning, editor-in-chief of the 125-year-old Fire Engineering magazine that brings together fire protection engineers to communicate with each other, showing an astounding ignorance of the government officials to the value of a thorough scientific investigation. The destruction and removal of evidence must stop immediately. Commission a fully resourced blue ribbon panel to conduct a clean and thorough investigation. How about expert corroboration? How about Danny Jewenko, 27-year controlled demolitions expert? It starts from below. They've simply blown away the columns. It's controlled demolition. A team of experts did this. It's professional work, without a doubt. Building 7, do we have any foreknowledge of its destruction? Listen to these construction workers walking away from Building 7 and this police officer caught on CNN camera. Keep your eye on that building. Keep coming down. Don't bring it. Hold it back. All right, guys. We are 